So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Paul a little bit about sound change, and to what extent we actually have expectations that potentially we could get an interaction. Because meaning can have some influence on sound changes. So um, when you have a language that has more minimal pairs that depend on a particular contrast, they are likely, less likely to have a merger that results in homophones. So it's a fairly small effect, so it isn't like you absolutely aren't going to get this merger, but it does suggest that there is some effect of this pressure of trying to avoid creating homophones. But notably, these are regular sound changes, it's just a difference in how likely you are to get that regular sound change, like the caught-caught merger um, in lots of dialects of English. So, much more rarely we get a particular word that's deflected from the particular outcome, so not a regular change, um, when it would have become homophonous with a vulgar word. So the classic example in English, uh, the Old English word shutan, which became shut, um, that vowel should have turned out as an it in modern English, um, but that's already a word and it's a vulgar word, so like that one seems to have been deflected from what by regular sound change should have been outcome. But that's really, really unusual and you basically only get it with these situations of having a swear word. Um, so the vast majority of sound changes really are regular, as we expect, and when we have cases of things that look tempting to call irregular sound changes, really we can attribute them to either sound changes that are regular but just have a very limited environment, so there are only a handful of words that are caught by them, um, or changes that are analogy, uh, such that they aren't actually sound changes at all, it's just comparison of two words that you, that you get that influence, um, or contact between languages or dialects. Um, so you get borrowings from a different dialect and then it might look like this word had an irregular sound change, but really it's not a sound change, it's just that you have taken a new item that looks really similar to what your inherited item would have looked like. Um, but in theory, we could get, we could predict phonologically irregular developments based on having lexically specific patterns of acoustics, because various people have observed that words can have phonetic differences based on things like frequency, and we've also demonstrated that um, listeners can be sensitive to within category uh, differences. Um, but then the question is, can we actually combine these things to get a separation um, between words? So the clearest example would be in homophones, where if two homophones split, it's definitely about that lexical effect, and it can't be just that we have a sound change with a really specific environment. So that's why I'm looking specifically um, at homophones. Because we definitely know that they have separate representations, at least at the semantic level, because they have different meanings. Um, this is reflected in a variety of ways. So you can get different frequency effects. So um, we access higher frequency words more quickly. Um, you can have in a variety of conditions that homophones won't prime each other, though they will prime themselves. Mostly these are in reading tasks, so you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, and we also have some observations of phonetic differences <coughs> based on word frequency and based on part of speech, but it's somewhat unclear how to interpret that because the places where we find them are often in corpora or otherwise in meaningful sentences. So they have this context and the differences disappear when you take them in frame sentences or in isolation. So it seems like a lot of these might be things that we can explain just as a combination of effects of prosodic position and contextual predictability, such that it's not something that we actually have to have as part of the representation, um, because we can explain them just as the results of contrast. <laughs> so, um, we can think about, well, how do these all fit together? If there are distinct lexical entries, um, could we start associating them with distinct phonological forms? Like, given that we do have some pressures against homophony, um, is that something that we get? Um, so once we have two things that exist as homophones, so not will they change their trajectory? Because for in the most part, well, we tolerate homophones, we have plenty of homophones, and even in cases where we have pernicious homophony, where there are two words that have similar enough meanings that it can become confusing in a problematic way to have both of them, one of them will just fall out of use instead of one of them changing to be pronounced in a different way. So is it even possible um, to get a split? So what I'm looking at is getting a little bit of production data, but the focus is on two ex perception experiments to really get at when we get these differences in productions between homophone mates, um, can listeners actually pick up on that and do you get differences either in the same different task 
or when you're asked to identify which one you heard. So then the other thing I'm considering is the role of the production environment. So either stimulus words extracted from meaningful sentences or produced in isolation, <coughs> where to the extent that we can get differences in production, we only actually expect those to be apparent in the first um, type of stimulus. So these were the two tasks, just giving you a little bit more detail. So um, in each one, there are 48 participants, uh, 24 in each of the conditions. So the conditions here are, were the words extracted from definitional sentences, or were they produced in isolation? So in any case, it's always an individual word, and the difference is just how is that word produced? Where are we getting it from? So are we expecting context effects or not? So in the same different task, listeners were just hearing these pairs of words and deciding were they the same or were they different. It always was two different voices, so the task was decidedly going to be, like, are they phonologically the same and never are they the same token? Um, and then in the identification task, it was the same stimuli as in the AX task, just you would get a single one of them, and then your response options would be the two paired items. So this is what the set of stimuli um, looked like. So in the AX task, there were four types. Um, so mostly we'll just be thinking about the first three. So we have homophone mate pairs. So here I can't say them because it'll be sort of meaningless because they're homophones. So in any case, we have sun where it's either sun as spelled with a U, meaning you know this shining star in the sky, or sun with an O, meaning you know male offspring. Um, versus uh, two types of same pairs, so it's either a word for which a homophone exists. So you can have two different elicitations of sun with a U, um, or you could have two different elicitations of something for which no homophone exists, like cat, where it's lexically unambiguous. There aren't two different items that you could have elicited um, as cat. And then, just because you, know, you need them as the fillers, uh, different pairs, and they always had a single segmental contrast. Uh, though it differed by block where in the word that contrast was, so there's an onset, nucleus, or coda, and there are some effects of that that are sort of um, secondary. Um, and as I said, crucially, it's always words from different speakers. And then in the identification task, there were uh, items where you're deciding between the clearly phonologically different pairs, so things like pat, cat, um, and ones where you're deciding which of these two homophone mates was it. So you have two different spellings, they're always hom uh, non-homographic homophones, so they were spelled differently. So it is in theory, you know, you can know which one is meant even if you can't actually distinguish between them. Okay, so basically the question is, to the extent that there are acoustic differences, and we can ask also, were there even acoustic differences, um, can listeners pick up on that? So if there are differences that listeners are sensitive to, then in the AX task, uh, the homophone mate pairs will be identified as different more often than the same pairs, which is, you know, son with a U, son with a U, versus son with a U, son with an O. Um, but then the other possibility is that the homophone mate pairs will behave just like same pairs, um, that there won't be any difference. And then in the identification task, it's, will people be any better than chance at deciding which of the two homophone mates um, they heard? So, getting into the results. So first, starting off with the AX task for words extracted from sentences. So I've just separated out into the two stimulus types because there are very different results for the two of them. So the homophone mate pairs in terms of responses patterned basically the same way as same pairs. So the vast majority of responses were the same, so 93% versus 94% um, versus 6% for pairs where they were just phonologically distinct. So pretty clearly falling into that category, people were perceiving them as phonologically the same. And we see a similar sort of thing if we look at response times where basically accurate responses are faster than inaccurate responses. Uh, so for same pairs, you have faster responses when people say that they were the same. And for homophone mate pairs, you see the same thing. When people said they were the same, those were faster than the few trials, the 6% uh, of trials where they said they were different. So there's a variety of things confirming that people really did generally perceive these as the same. But this is just laying out the patterns of responses. So the note is very high in all of these cases, but we do have our three different uh, types of pairs. And there were somewhat small effects um, in how frequently people identified them as 
being different, which mostly seems to amount to was it lexically ambiguous? So there was a difference between the cat, cat type and the two sun sun types, where it mostly seems to amount to if people know that there are two lexical items that have that pronunciation, they're more likely to guess that they're different, just because there, it sort of suggests that there's some uncertainty about even knowing whether homophones exist. So they might be thinking to themselves, oh, well, these are spelled differently. Are they actually pronounced differently? So, but notably, no difference between the first and the second type, where was it son with the U, son with an O, or son with the U, son with the U. But where we get <laughs> um, more interpretable differences, perhaps, are among the response times, where here the homophone mate pairs were identified more slowly than the other two pair types. So it, it depended on were the two instances of sun elicited with the same meaning in the same context, or was it elicited with the different meanings. Um, so we see a significant difference between those two types. So was it two instances of sun with the U, or was it one instance of sun with the U, and not one with the So people were slower with the homophone mate pairs, which does suggest that People are picking up on some of these contextually conditioned um, differences that you get in homophone mate pairs that you don't get in just the variability of different people saying the same word. So this is just um, laying out a regression model of all of the effects. So we see the main thing that we're interested in is the two type effects at the top where we see, so as compared to the same pairs where it was a word for which a homophone mate exists. Um, that we see slower responses for the homophone um, mate pairs um, and no difference with the words like cat where there's no homophone. Um, but we also see a variety of other effects like where in the word um, the contrast was and also a big effect of was the response same or different, some interaction of what the actual response was and what the type was that ended up, even if you exclude that, you still get the same main effects. So, one of the things we see, well, why are we getting these differences between homophone mate pairs? If these are being responded to more slowly than other things, there must be something that is different between the two types of sun-sun pairs. These people are responding to them differently, or their, their response times are different. Um, and indeed, when you look at the actual stimuli used for these words produced in sentences, there were greater differences between the items in the homophone mate pairs than between um, items in the same pairs, even when comparing just the two sun-sun types. Um, so, uh, maybe. so basically they should be phonologically identical um, in both of these cases. Um, so it's a fairly small set of items, so it doesn't reach significance, but there's this fairly consistent trend. So you could say one of the things that differs, it isn't necessarily going to be a frequency effect, but you can also get it just based on you have non-identical sentences because there are always <laughs> disambiguating sentential contexts. So it could just be, well, you are listening these words in two different sentences versus in the same sentence, and you can get an effect of that. So it's not even necessarily specifically about the word pairs, though they were all definitional sentences, so they should have pretty similar context. So it was things like the sun is a star, um, so very similar types of um, prosody across the different uh, sentences. So listeners are sensitive to the various dimensions of acoustic distance, so if you added in some of these measures into the regression model. Some of them turn out as significant, so vowel duration, also Euclidean distance, so basically looking at F1 and F2 and how distinct um, those are. So this is looking across all of the same pair types, not just the homophone mate. So listeners are sensitive to this, and this seems to be what's driving the effect. Uh, so it's not, so it's basically something that we can predict just based on there's some differences in acoustic distance between pair types and people are influenced by acoustic distance. And mostly this is just looking at response times. Um, there was a similar effect on responses, but it was much weaker, partially because people were basically at ceiling for accuracy, or responses, I should say, to make, not make assumptions about what accuracy means for all of them. Um, okay, so I'm doing the same thing, but going through the AX task for words produced in isolation. So again, they have having like same pairs, very similar um, results in terms of responses and how response times interacted with responses. Uh, we see basically the same graph um, in terms of the responses and how they differ by response times, or again, um, where they were lexically unambiguous, people were more likely to just say those were the same all the time. Um, 
for response times, we see a different effect. So here I've separated out by response because uh, it sort of becomes clear because there's um, more of an interaction between type and response where basically you see the fastest responses for the cat-cat type, but there was no difference between the homophone mate pairs and pairs where it's the same word, um, but it happens to be a word that's lexically, lexically ambiguous because a homophone mate exists. So we see sort of that one down there on the left versus you know the two um, higher up. And you see that reflected also if uh, we look at the regression model where there's no significant difference between uh, same pairs for a word that has a homophone versus the homophone mate pairs, but there is a significant difference between those two and um, the lexically unambiguous pairs, the non ones that are called non hom which is just you know, homophone mate. And then basically the other effects we see um, are basically uh, the same um, patterns of uh, you're slower to make decisions when you're making decisions about the end of the word, you're slower when you end up being wrong and so on. Okay, so again, we do see that listeners were sensitive to acoustic distance. The particular things that came out as significant were different, where this might fit into basically that there was somewhat less variability because these were words that were produced in isolation. So we didn't have some of these large effects that were driven by context. So there was no difference in how distant the two paired items were. Um, we were comparing the homophone mate pairs versus the same pairs of uh, the words for which homophones exist. So some of the U, some of an O versus some of the U, some of the U. No difference in like how distant the two people's, the two speakers' productions were. So there still are these effects of acoustic distance. It's just that those aren't driving any sort of uh, effect between the pair types. So then ending with the identification task which is um, perhaps the really interesting one. Um, so identifying which of two written items match an acoustic stimulus. So answers were presented, one on the left side of the screen, one on the right, and then responses were just given with the corresponding arrow keys. It was counterbalanced for which side of the screen the correct answer is on, because people have a really strong preference, if it's ambiguous, to select the one on the left, because that's the one they see first, reading left to right. Um, and then also counterbalanced for which home phone mate was the answer, because they're also um, a variety of frequency biases that we will see. Uh, so basically this is what it looks like for the homophones, homophone mates produced in context. So accuracy was at about 51%. Um, in contrast, accuracy for the pairs where it was things like cat-cat, where they're distinctly phonologically different, um, those were at 97%. So, you know, the participants were trying to do the task when they had really clear trials, they were good at those. Um, and they weren't that good at the homophony trials, though it did turn out as being significant. Not particularly significant, so a pretty tiny effect, um, but something there. So the other things we see, people have a bias towards the left side of the screen, they also have a bias towards selecting the higher frequency item. Um, so if you just look at one of the homophone mate pairs, you might say, oh look, people are really accurate for this one, but it's because that's the one that they always responded. Um, but, so notably, that, mate, that first value you get is looking at um, what were the odds and were we um, better than even odds for getting the right one. Uh, so it does seem like there's some difference that we can pick up on based on basically our experience of hearing these words in context that you have a little bit of a memory of, that we can map onto and say, well, does this match well what I've heard for this word in this context and so on. So of course, a tiny, pretty tiny effect, but it does seem like it's there. And one of the things that also does seem to suggest that it's a real effect is that we get an effect of the contrast type. So um, people were less likely to be accurate when the contrasts for the actually distinct pairs were in codas versus when they were in nuclei. So it seems like having your attention drawn to different parts of the word does influence your accuracy at whatever small cues we can pick up on to try to make this contrast. So notably, these are homophones extracted from sentences, so we still get some of these effects of their, um, their sentential context. So basically, if you get the words produced in isolation, you don't get any of that. People are right at chance. Um, you don't get any effect of the position of the contrast, and so on. So this is where we wouldn't expect any difference because we couldn't find any acoustic differences. So it would be really surprising if they're better than chance here. Um, and basically, the accuracy was 
also a chance for each individual pair in both of those tasks. So to the extent that we're getting an effect, it's not driven by one pair. Um, it's driven sort of across the board. Uh, and also there's zero correlation between the two experiments. So not all of the homophone pairs appear in all of them, but um, it's they almost right at zero. So this is just a summary of all the results. Um, I'll skip over that and basically say, OK, so what can we conclude? So basically, I think what this points towards is that where we observe those differences in production between homophones mate, homophone mates, they're due to context, and they aren't part of the representation, partially just because you eliminate them when you produce words in isolation or out of context. Um, and um, so basically, uh, they do influence response times when you have these juxtaposed, but they don't change perception. Um, and But we have fairly weak memories that might allow us to choose slightly above chance and identification tasks, but I don't think that's part of the representation. I think that's more of sort of this exemplar memory um, effect. Um, so basically, uh, it doesn't give us any sort of difference that we can leverage to predict uh, irregular splits because differences don't enter the representation. And when we're updating representations, they're at the category level um, and not the word level. Thank you.